I begin my tour where other travelers have ended theirs, on the confines of the wilderness and at the last village of white inhabitants between the Mississippi River and the Pacific Ocean. Henry Rose Schoolcraft was born in Albany County, New York to Lawrence and Margaret Schoolcraft. His father was the superintendent of a glass factory and after Schoolcraft received an education he followed in his father's footsteps. While he was working at the factory he took private classes with a professor by the name of Frederick Hall at Middlebury College. Professor Hall taught him mineralogy and geology. Even though Schoolcraft did not officially go to college, his performance in his science classes really impressed Professor Hall. I know no person on this side of the Atlantic who stands a fairer chance than yourself to become a first-rate operative chemist. Even though he showed such promise as a chemist, he ended up failing at running the glassworks in New Hampshire. He had to file for bankruptcy in 1817 and move out west for a fresh start. How could a failed chemist offer Arkansas any historical relevance? Well, because it's not what he failed at doing that makes him important. It's what he succeeded at doing afterwards. During the summer of 1818, almost a year after Schoolcraft filed bankruptcy, he began to get involved in surveying the land of Missouri. While he was surveying Missouri's mining and smelting operations, he overheard rumors of rich lead deposits along the White River Valley. That winter, Schoolcraft and Levi Pettibone, a New Yorker as well, decided to embark on a three-month, 900-mile journey through Missouri and Arkansas into the White River Valley. We turned to pursue our way with such feelings as many travelers have experienced on turning their backs upon the comforts and endearments of life, to encounter fatigue, hard fare, and danger. On Friday, November 6th, 1818, the men left Potosi, Missouri about 3 p.m. They had guns, warm clothes, and a pack horse that carried their skins, their axe, medicine, gunpowder, food, kitchen utensils, and other provisions. After the first night of sleeping in the wilderness, the duo quickly realized how little they actually knew about the skills needed to survive. We find it necessary to gain a knowledge of things, of which before we knew nothing, and in which we had not any experience, such as the art of hobbling a horse properly, the best method of building a campfire, how to cook a piece of venison, or boil a pot of coffee. During the first week of their journey, their horse wandered off twice. They had to hunt him down each time. They came across a cabin that belonged to a hunter named Roberts and his wife. She told us also that our guns were not well adapted to our journey, that we should have rifles, and pointed out some other errors in our dress, equipments, and mode of traveling while we stood in astonishment to hear a woman direct us in matters which we had before thought the peculiar and exclusive province of men. Each home that they would enter, they would gather more information about how to survive. They would learn what kind of guns they needed, what clothes they should wear, and what places they should steer clear of. Roberts agreed to accompany the duo until the next town so they wouldn't get lost. After almost a week, Roberts disappeared. He left to chase a deer, and he never returned. After Roberts disappeared, they didn't see another human being for 20 days. Three days later, Pettibone and Schoolcraft are walking along a river when they come across four bears. Pettibone sprains his ankle while running away from the bears. The next day, November 18, 1818, Schoolcraft spent the day doctoring up his ankle. They soaked it in salts. The next day, Pettibone's ankle felt a lot better. They continued their journey, but Pettibone rode on the horse until he was completely better. On November 21st, the horse, completely submerged in the water that the team was trying to cross, all of their supplies were ruined. Their clothes, their food, their ammunition, tea, all the other supplies were soaked. It happened around nighttime, so it was too late to gather new supplies. The duo had to try and salvage what was left. Two days later, the horse wandered off again. They found him after searching for a few hours. Food started to become scarce, so Schoolcraft and Pettibone faced hunger. They got lost and came across another hunter that directed them to a nearby town. Schoolcraft and Pettibone were overjoyed to finally be in civilization, 
There was food, supplies, and people. The group from the village accompanied them to help direct them to the right path that would lead them to their destination for a hefty price. The group also agreed to accompany them because they wanted to hunt the four bears that chased the duo a few days prior to their arrival. However, they ended up leaving Schoolcraft and Pettibone to chase after an animal. The duo was more relieved than scared, though. As they were approaching the one-month mark, their horse got stuck in mire. After nearly an hour, they were able to get him out. Now, this all happened in the first month of their journey. November had pleasant weather, but December had to come, and winter was now upon the duo. Schoolcraft and Pettibone moved on and came across hunter cabins. The Holt and Fisher family occupied that land. Schoolcraft soon learned how the Holts and Fishers lived and their view on religion. He was disgusted. Children were raised without an education and encouraged to begin hunting as early as possible. He claimed the boys acted violently and that the women ended up sick doing the men's work. Witchcraft and a belief in the sovereign virtue of certain metals, so prevalent in those periods of the history of the progress of the human mind, which reflect disgrace upon our species, has still their advocates here. Children are wholly ignorant of the knowledge of books and have not learned even the rudiments of their own tongue, but was rather characterized in partaking of whatever was disgusting, terrific, rude, the state of society among the rising generation in this region is truly deplorable. Being deprived of all the advantages of dress possessed by our fair countrywomen in the East, they are no means calculated to inspire admiration, but on the contrary, disgust. He was very opinionated when it came to the lives of the white hunters. On December 14th, Schoolcraft and Pettibone bribed Holt, a white hunter that lives with his family and the Fisher family on the banks of Beaver Creek, to be their guide and hunter, and he agreed for $10, their horse, and any skins and furs that the group came across on the journey. Holt and Fisher left for one week to retrieve corn for their family. The duo took care of the families while the men were gone. The group leaves five days after Fisher and Holt get back. Schoolcraft comes upon an abandoned Osage camp. He was amazed by how intricate their buildings and tents were. He was mesmerized by the Native Americans' way of living compared to the white hunter's way of living. The white hunter, on encamping in his journey, cuts down green trees and builds a large fire of long logs, sitting at some distance from it. The Indian hunts up a few dry limbs, cracks them into little pieces a foot in length, builds a fire, and sits close by it. He gets as much warmth as the white hunter without half the labor and does not burn more than a fiftieth part of the wood. The Indian considers the forest his own and is careful in using and preserving everything which it affords. The white hunter destroys all before him and cannot resist the opportunity of killing game, although he neither wants the meat or can carry the skins. Holt and his group decide to take the duo back to their camp. Now, it had been almost a week. However, they kept getting lost and turned around because it had snowed a lot. They became so lost that they gambled on one of their horses being able to lead them home. Schoolcraft was not very hopeful. The horse ended up leading them correctly. It had now been two months for Schoolcraft and Pettibone. On January 8th, the duo decides to head back home. They left on the 9th in a canoe that went down the White River. They were better prepared this time. Schoolcraft hurt his ankle on January 19th. Now, this happened at the worst possible location because it was away from society. His ankle throbbed so he could only hobble, and they still had a ways to go to get home. A man on a horse ended up trotting by, and he let them borrow his horse, but for a price. On January 21st, Mr. Pettibone parted with Schoolcraft because Schoolcraft's ankle was still looking pretty bad, he wanted to hurry home. Schoolcraft had to walk some, but he was able to travel by canoe the rest of the way. Schoolcraft arrived in Potosi, Missouri on February 4th, 1819. In 1821, Schoolcraft published his journal. He called it Journal of a Tour into the Interior of Missouri and Arkansas. His journal described his experience. He gave details about the wildlife, plants, soil, caves, and the people he observed. His journal was the first published record of the Missouri and Arkansas Ozarks. 
The weather has been mild and very pleasant for the season, with an unclouded sky and a slight breeze from the southwest. This cave is situated in a high wall of limestone rock forming the southern bank of Cave Creek. Number 5. Granular Quartz, rounded by attrition, color grayish-white, easily crushed between two stones and falling in... His writings may have provided information and created a new world of readers. After his three-month journey, Schoolcraft became a government official. He mainly worked in relation with the Native Americans. He married Jane Johnston in 1823. They had three children, but one of them died before he turned four. During 1837, disaster struck. A financial panic wiped out the family's savings, and his wife died suddenly. Ten years later, he remarried. That same year, he had a stroke that left him dependent on his new wife. With his wife's help, he published one more book, but it had organization and index errors. Almost 20 years later, he died after several other strokes and he passed away in Washington, D.C. Even though Schoolcraft's ending and beginning was rough, he made the expedition of a lifetime. Pettibone and Schoolcraft were referred to as the Lewis and Clark of the Ozarks. Their journey can be traced all throughout rural Arkansas and Missouri. Mike Perkins. Professor at Williams Baptist College in Walter Ridge, uh, native of Lawrence County. Grew up on working on this farm right here. Other parts of it. One farmer's backwoods may have been another's trail of exploration. <laughs>